For centuries, it's been common practice around the world for those caught committing a crime to get locked up, from stealing a loaf of bread to killing another man. The length of sentences has varied widely. But as prisons fill up and costs rise, some are asking if punitive sentences are even the best way to deter convicts from reoffending. Yvette McCullough looks at the approach of two countries. It's known as the land of the free, with liberty given the greatest value. But the United States has the highest rate of people behind bars of any country in the world. The US spends $80 billion a year on incarceration. In 2014, the number of people in state and federal prisons was 1,561,500. One in nine inmates in the US are serving life sentences while the majority of those serving a sentence of a year or longer committed a non-violent crime, and around 50% of these are for drug offences. The US prison system is criticised for being overcrowded and having poor conditions. And studies suggest high levels of incarceration have little to no impact on decreasing crime, as more than half of those released in the US will be back within three years. Norway is known as a leading example of how incarceration can be humane and effective. Its so-called restorative justice is based on rehabilitation rather than punishment. Its prison facilities are described as the most luxurious in the world. And as Breivik, who is serving 21 years for killing 77 people in 2011, successfully sued the government, saying the conditions in prison violated his human rights. In 2014, only 3,717 people were incarcerated out of Norway's population of 5 million. And it had one of the lowest rates of repeat offenders in the world, with only 20% of inmates breaking the law again within two years. But inmate numbers in Norway are rising. Its prisons are at capacity, and it has outsourced more than 200 cells to a prison in the Netherlands. So is this model a benchmark for countries to consider? and is rehabilitation, rather than imprisonment, the better response to crime. Yvette McCullough, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now to discuss this further is Baz Dreisinger, author of Incarceration Nations, and John Lott, president of Crime Prevention Research Center. Thanks, both of you, for joining us. Let me start with you, John Lott. Incarceration rates are up. The U.S. has a quarter of the world's prison population. Is that worth it and normal for you? Well, I think the reason why we have so many people in prison is we have a drug gang problem in the United States. You know, if you want to talk about whether how we should deal with drug gangs, then I'm happy to go and do that. But, you know, as far as private prisons, I mean, there's a reason why, whether it's private schools or whether it's uh, private garbage collection or private prisons, uh, if profits are on the line, people have an incentive to try to figure out how to produce better quality products at a lower price. I mean, there's a general rule that private provision of different goods cost about half what it does for the government to do. So, you know, if you want to go to have poor quality services and it cost more, then you have the government do it. Okay, Baz Dreisinger, there's a drug gang problem and lots of people commit crime. That's why a quarter of the world's prison population is in U.S. prisons. What do you think? Uh, well, obviously, I think <laughs> I find that ludicrous. Um, for one, the, the the reason why so many people are in prison is because of our uh, the U.S.'s ridiculous approach to drug policy, um, because of systemic racism, systemic inequality that is funneling people directly into the prison system. Uh, when it comes to as for private prisons you know, they're not products, they're human beings. So I think the focus that we have to have is on how do we create a more just, a more equitable, and a more functional system. Um, and we're talking about a, something like a 60% recidivism rate in this country. Um, and the rates do not look much better elsewhere around the world. If any other company were operating on such statistics, it would be shut down immediately. Baz, putting aside the death penalty, you would agree that there are some people who deserve being locked up for life, right? 
Uh, I wouldn't say locked up. I think there are people who need to be, who are not capable of existing in society peacefully uh, and safely, and they would need to be removed, yes. Um, but the conditions under which they would need to be removed would look dramatically different from a prison. The other thing I'll say is that that is the exception and not the rule. Um, you know, people ask about mass murderers and such. That's the exception. That's not the bulk of who's in our prison. Uh, and so that's not the conversation we really need to be having. We need to be thinking about the, the mass of people that are being incarcerated in the U.S. and globally uh, on relatively minor offenses and, and such. Okay, but let me just finally follow up with this before I move on. What would you do with people who, for example, abduct kids, rape those kids, and then murder them? You would, you would agree that they need to be locked up for life but, and, and punished, right? You're not trying to rehabilitate them, are you? I think rehabilitation is, is always a possibility to be on the table. Do I think everyone can be rehabilitated or, frankly, habilitated? No. And there are absolutely people who need to be uh, removed from society. But again, I don't feel that's the productive conversation to have, because that is not the bulk of who is in our prison system or most countries' prison systems. Five years without parole for five grams of crack. Is that fair? Well, I mean, as I said, I would radically change the prison rules for drug offenses. Uh, that may be one thing your guest and I agree on, on that. But, uh, you know, I don't think that there's a racist component to these things. I think that what's happening is, is that these rules were originally put in place with regard to crack. I mean, I was there at the Sentencing Commission when these rules were put in place, it was because there was a lot of violent crime in urban areas, and there was a call from people in minority communities to do something about the crack cocaine epidemic. Now, do I think it was a mistake, particularly looking back on what happened? Sure, I do. But the, but you know, the question is, for violent crimes where somebody's harming somebody else, I think that prison is extremely important. You want to make it costly. You want to deter people from committing those types of crimes. And the notion that somehow uh, reform is uh, the way to go. That makes it less bad for these guys to be locked up, and you reduce the punishment, you're going to end up committing, having more crimes being committed. Baz, are you buying any of that? Uh, absolutely not. I, I don't even think much of this really is up for debate or a question. I mean, the, the idea of the disparity Seriously. in sentences, the racial disparity in sentencing between crack and cocaine uh, has been shown time and again. We're certainly in agreement about radical, not reform, but overhaul in terms of our drug laws. That's certainly the case. Um, and as for deterrence, I think if prison were deterring crime, then we would have a far safer society as it exists now. I mean, what is, what is the 60% recidivism rate? Lastly, I'll say uh, that viol the idea of violent crime, I mean, what gets classified as violent can sometimes be quite questionable. Um, and the line between, quote, violent offenders and nonviolent offenders can be, uh, again, questionable. As far as drug laws, we are seeing the repeal of all sorts of three strikes you're out laws all over the country, here in New York, the Rockefeller drug laws. Um, these are all being dismantled because there is widespread, widespread recognition that they were based on uh, racial disparities and that they don't make any sense from a safety perspective uh, and from a justice perspective. Yeah, okay, John, even, even Bill Clinton said that he regretted the passing of the three strikes and you're out law. John? Well, I mean, you have lots of politics that are involved in terms of people making decisions now. But I don't, I guess I just don't see the problem. If somebody repeatedly commits violent crimes, and I don't think that there's a hard time figuring out whether violent crimes occurred, whether one person has physically harmed another person uh, there, that there's been physical contact and damage done to the prison. other person. That seems pretty straightforward to me. No, but you said it's hard to define what a violent crime is, and I'm saying it's pretty easy to define what a violent crime is. That when somebody commits those types of violent crimes repeatedly, you have to ask yourself, do you really want to let but this individual not, but out But you realize again that's not who's being sent back to prison. Another rape. We're not sending people back that's, to prison who are repeatedly committing violent was what crimes. Is question when you're talking about the three strikes and you're out, that's exactly what the type of person you're talking about. They have to commit multiple violent crimes 
to be in that category. Okay, and, but and different states and different judges point. differ on Do interpretations. Do you learn something? Can, okay, can, can I move on for a second? Because I want to bring in the comparison sure. with Norway, Baz, because you're a fan of the Norwegians. They have 75 people per 100,000 in their prisons. The U.S. has 700 per 100,000. Why are you such a big fan of the Norwegians, Baz? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of multiple aspects of the way that they approach justice. Uh, there's something called the open prison model that's practiced throughout Scandinavia, whereby people in prison are um, permitted to come and go, maintain connections to the communities, and therefore have a much easier time re-entering society and maintaining their status as citizens when they come home and, and they've served their time. Uh, and it also creates safer communities. I'm a fan of their approach to uh, corrections when someone is in an institution, even in a more traditional institution, in that it allows people the opportunity to genuinely be involved in this thing that we call corrections uh, and genuinely enact rehabilitation. There are lots of programs. There is education. Uh, there is there's a whole host of rehabilitative programs that are doing incredible things for people on the inside that isn't happening here. There are relationships between corrections officers and the people in prison that are, again, genuinely restorative mm -hmm. uh, and rehabilitative, uh, things that we might learn from. Okay, let me then ask you about Anders Bering Breivik. He killed 77 people. He had a three-cell complex. He was right. allowed to play video games. He had a TV. He sued the government um, and said that they're, they're, they're impeding his human rights, and he won. Is that the type of system that you want to defend, Baz? <laughs> again, first of all, yes. But again, um, Breivik, who committed an atrocious, vile deed uh, and, and will likely not see society again, is not the person we need to be talking about. He is the exception, not the rule. But doesn't it tell us um, something clearly, about the system, he Baz? Is clearly we are, yes, it does. It says that the system is committed to trying to rehabilitate everybody while recognizing that not everyone can be rehabilitated. The system is committed to keeping the community but safe. But it doesn't work. Uh, such that they're keeping him away from, from doing that harm ever again. Uh, and it says, but we're still recognizing the possibility of rehabilitation here. I fully support that. John Lott, final Look, comments from you. I mean, I, I'm not a believer and fundamentally okay. in right. an I mean, there, there are two points to and make I here. I think that's what it comes excuse down me. to. Excuse me. John, excuse coming. me. Excuse me. There, there are a couple points to make here. One is when you're talking about a maximum prison term of 20 years for s someone like the mass killer that you just talked about, there's no additional cost for that individual, when he, whether he goes from 50 people killed to 77 people killed. You have to have something to go and try to deter these individuals. But be, beyond that, you know, we well, we, we, we already know multiple studies all, have Norway shown that long also, prison sentences excuse do not me, deter excuse people from me, committing crimes. Excuse me, that is completely false. There's tons of research out there. <laughs> Did you read the academic research? Look, the notion that somehow uh, if I you make academic, something more yes. costly, more difficult, people won't. Well, it, you don't. Your English, I know, you, that's not statistics. So in any case, uh, you know, you go and you look at Norway. And there's no, no evidence that these open prisons that they have on Bastoy Island, for example, uh, which isolates people. You may not have, uh, you know, uh, walls there, but you have water around the island. There's no evidence that they have lower recidivism rates. You have self-selection. Who there gets put into is. that Norway's particular type of nice Norway's recidivism rate is about prison. half of ours. The question is for those who go to an open prison versus the because they have regular prisons in Norway, right? It's the question is do those yes, who go to this I, I open was in them, prison I was in them both. have a lower recidivism? Look. You it's, keep on wanting to interrupt one, somebody. For that's one, fine. the country's okay. recidivism rate but, is about half ours. Okay, the John, final response. That, okay, uh, no, it, but the it, question okay. is Baz, also important. It's Baz, if you don't mind. for other reasons. John, is respond to the half the recidivism rate. Uh, I respond to that. Norway's is half of America's recidivism rate, and I'll let that be the final comment because I've got to wrap. Please. Right. Well, they've had a lower recidivism rate well before they had the changes in the prison system that were there. The question is, did the change, do those open prisons produce lower recidivism rate? Not just going, you know, because otherwise you're not explaining why they had a much lower recidivism rate before they changed the prison right. system. Okay. 
I'll let that be the final word because unfortunately we are out of time. I've got a wrap. Bas Reisinger and John Lott, thank you very much for joining us.